Uh, first, uh, this is a GLP-1 symposium, and our first speaker is Dr. Nandita Arum, and uh, we know she is from Dr. A. Ramchandran Diabetes Hospital, Chennai uh, uh, Hospital, and she herself is a director and a consultant diabetologist. She had her uh, FRCP uh, in the from Glasgow and also from training in Cambridge. She also had her CMC valor. But her main important thing is she has a connection in Ahmedabad in the sense that she had her uh, health care management uh, uh, training at IIM Ahmedabad also. And she has received the Young Achiever Award, right, Dr. Cherin Award from the WHO in 2019. So over to you, Madam, for your discussion on GLP-1, the cardioprotective effect and umbrella overview. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, Ahmedabad is indeed very close to my heart. Um, uh, very good evening to everyone. Um, I hope everyone is doing well and uh, doing safe. Nice to connect uh, and see uh, familiar faces uh, on a Saturday evening. Um, and uh, of course, I cannot start before I uh, thank Bansi, sir, for uh, inviting me for this wonderful meeting. I will just be sharing my slides. Is my uh, first slide uh, visible? Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. So, um, yes, so the next um, couple of minutes, I'm going to be discussing the GLP-1 receptor uh, agonists and their um, cardioprotective or their CV benefits and the, um, uh, the, the, the cardiovascular outcome trials <clears throat> and what they've in fact showed us over the past decade or so. So uh, before I start my talk, I would of course like to start off with some uh, epidemiological data. This is data from our center that we've been reporting. Um, of course, we all know that the prevalence of type 2 diabetes has been literally um, you know, uh, uh, exploding over the years, and we have been we have data that we've been reporting from um, southern India over the past uh, you know uh, many years, right from 1980s. So as we can see, this is a slide in which we have <clears throat> serial records of the prevalence of type 2 diabetes in both the urban as well as the uh, rural population. So right from the 1980s, the digits have actually been initially, it was only around single digits, around 5% in the 1980s, um, and then to 8%. And over the years, it started exploding to double digits. And we have data uh, right up to 2006, uh, which is 18% in the urban, urban and uh, almost 10% in the rural population. So what we wanted to do was actually go back, uh, because we had serially been recording um, the epidemiological data and uh, uh, you know, sort of reporting the incidence of uh, prevalence of type 2 diabetes. So we wanted to actually see how the current scenario is and whether it is still in fact increasing over the years. So which brought us to the so-called STRIDE study. And uh, this was uh, published recently in which uh, we wanted to report the whether there is an increase in the trend of type 2 diabetes over the years. So this was called the stride or the secular trends in diabetes in India uh, to report whether 10 years later, when we go back and report epidemiological data to see if there is an increase in the epidemiology. Yeah. So um, these are the three regions. Why I put this map was because just to uh, show us exactly what are the areas that we're looking at. So Chennai was the town, Kanchipuram was the, uh, sorry, Chennai was the city, Kanchipuram was the town, and Pandruti was the village from which we reported data 10 years ago, and we had, in fact, been seriously reporting data. So we wanted to go back into uh, uh, to the same places at the same locations and report data again. <coughs> And in fact, we found that when we went back 10 years later to the same places, we found that there was in fact still a significant increase in the prevalence of type 2 diabetes. And it was surprising that it was not just in the city or in the town, but even in the villages that we have an increase in the prevalence of type 2 diabetes. So we have a huge burden in our hands that we're dealing with. So now that we know that it is in fact increasing and that we do have a big burden of type 2 diabetes, what are the risk factors that are associated with these increase in the risk of type 2 diabetes? So when we actually did a regression analysis to look at what are the risk variables associated with this increase in the prevalence of type 2 diabetes, we have found that it was positive family history and age, of course, which are the non-modifiable risk factors. But most importantly, the weight circumference, which was actually 
standing out to be one of the most important risk variables, not just in the city or in the town, but even in the villages that we found that there is an increase. And also sedentary lifestyle turned out to be a risk factor in the villages. So an increase in the central adiposity uh, is something that is a point of concern. When we compare data, this is data looking at BMI in the city, town, and in the village from 2006 to versus 2016, we find that there is, in fact, a significant increase in the prevalence of uh, the increase in the BMI in all the uh, populations, including not just in the urban, but also in the rural population. Similarly, as I mentioned earlier, the waste circumference also is increasing over the years. Um, so this is just basically why I wanted to present this data is to sort of um, uh, for us to understand what is the burden that we're dealing with, not just in terms of type 2 diabetes, but what are the risk factors that are contributing to this increase in um, uh, uh, type 2 diabetes. And one of them is the increase in BMI and waist circumference. So we have a big burden in our hands, uh, especially in, um, in our part of the world. We also know that one of the major um, complications or one of the pillars till date with the patients with type 2 diabetes till, till, till date remains cardiovascular disease. There is 80% um, of the CV burden is in the middle income countries like ours. And one third of people living with type 2 diabetes have increased um, risk of cardiovascular disease. This is what we all know. Uh, and till date, cardiovascular disease contributes or, or remains the number one um, cause for mortality in our patients with diabetes. We also know that as there is an increase in the HbA1c, the risk of cardiovascular disease also goes up. So there's a strong association of a higher HbA1c with the risk of cardiovascular disease. So what is the percentage of HPA1C that we have in our patients? So this is again data that we had very recently published just this year <clears throat> in which we wanted to look at the clinical profile of patients who are clinically diagnosed or newly detected with type 2 diabetes. So the design of this particular study was to compare, I'm going to move on to the next slide to exactly explain what this is, but we wanted to compare the clinical profile of patients who present to the clinic at diagnosis of type 2 diabetes to those who are the screened population. So for the big difference between the two is that the first circle that we see is patients who present to the clinic and are newly detected with type 2 diabetes versus patients who are screened from the population or undiagnosed people where we screen and detect type 2 diabetes. And we wanted to compare both these two groups to find out the uh, difference in the clinical profile. And this is the result that we found that we, we found that those patients who are clinically diagnosed present to the clinic uh, for diagnosis of type 2 diabetes or at diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, the HbA1c, average HbA1c, and I think our attention can be mainly on this uh, part of the plot over here, where the HbA1c average HbA1c is around 9.1 versus those who are diagnosed while there is a vast difference of HbA1c of just 8.3. And this is an important difference because what we have to understand is that those who present to the clinic are actually presenting much later than those who are actually screened in the population. So late diagnosis for patients who actually come to us who are clinically detected with type 2 diabetes. And in fact, these patients may even have complications at diagnosis. So when we come back to the same slide that we looked at earlier, that till date, type 2 diabetes is the number one risk factor for cardiovascular disease, and people with diabetes have a uh, huge uh, cardiovascular risk burden. Or to you, Dr. Nandita, but... Then your voice is uh, going very low in between. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. So I was not audible up until now. Breaking and it's very low in between. I see. Okay, let me just try on my headphone. Am I audible right now as I speak? Am I 
audible now yes ma'am yes yes okay this is good perfect perfect ma'am okay super thank you thank you so much yeah so um the um, like i was saying this is the same slide that we were looking at earlier in which we find that the prevalence of type of uh, cardiovascular disease is much higher and and type 2 diabetes is one of the major cardiovascular risk factors um and yet this is uh, data to show that although we do know that patients with type 2 diabetes have a huge cardiovascular risk burden the um merely eight, less than 8% of our patients with type 2 diabetes are receiving a cv protective agent so this is extremely important because we need to be more proactive and it is it's quite sad that hardly less than 8% of our population is receiving a cv protective drug and we all know that in um, today's era we do have a large number of drugs that um, are uh, proven that uh, which have proven their cv safety and benefit beyond doubt and this is of course a snapshot of all these drugs that we have today available which have proven their cv safety we've had a whole lot of cardiovascular outcome trials over the past decade um and um, most of these drugs have pro uh, proven their cardiovascular safety and if just less than 8% of our patients are in fact only receiving um you know cardio uh, protective agents then there is definitely something that we should rethink in our um uh, management of type 2 diabetes so what are the cvots now moving on to the cardiovascular outcome trials and the success stories that we've had over the past decade we know that the first few cvots that came out uh, with their results were the ones with the dpp4 inhibitors namely the severtimi uh, and the um, ticos and um, the earlier cvots that came out with the dpp4 inhibitors but i'm going to move on uh, to the success stories because the first few cardiovascular outcome trials that came out were with the dpp4 inhibitors and these were actually neutral trials then came the game changers or the success stories which were with the sglt2s and the uh, glp1 analogs which were extremely successful trials that in fact prove uh prove cardiovascular benefit beyond doubt and um these are the trials that we are probably going to be discussing of course my topic for the day is going to be pertaining to the glp1 receptor agonist so this is a snapshot of the cvots i know many of us i mean for uh, the the audience is uh, well versed with these results so i don't want to spend too much time on this particular slide but i would like to just highlight the uh, main two cardiovascular outcome trials which are relevant to our um, uh, you know uh, part of the world the main two ones that we have available are liraglutide and dulaglutide so the uh, leader trial of course was one of the largest cardiovascular outcome trials which had recruited around 9000 subjects with type 2 diabetes to both lira as well as placebo and uh, they showed a significant this trial actually showed a significant 13% reduction in three point mace and 22% reduction in cv death and 15% reduction in all cause mortality the next one was the rewind trial which was using dulaglutide in which again around 10000 subjects were recruited and they actually showed a, again a 12% reduction in a uh, three point mace and a 9% reduction in um uh, cv mortality 10% reduction in all cause mortality um what of course uh, is probably worth mentioning at this point is uh, important um, uh, or um, interesting results that we also got from the pioneer 6 which is just an oral sema uh, semaglutide an oral glp1 uh, which in fact showed a significant 21% reduction in three point mace and a 51% reduction in cardiovascular death and all cause mortality which was uh, very very interesting because oral uh, glp1 is something that is very exciting um, that may actually change the way that we um, use the glp1 receptor agonist so this is basically a snapshot and um, just to show how the uh, glp1 receptor agonists in fact have been um, extremely successful in um, their cvots in proving cardiovascular benefit beyond uh, anything else so now let's compare now we know that the two major groups among the um, anti hyperglycemic agents that we have are the sglt now when it when we compare this is the empareg that we have on the left and then we have the um, sorry 
Yeah, so we have the MPAR reg on the left and then we have the leader trial on the right. Now, when we compare results from both the trials and we look at three-point maze, CV death, non-fatal MI and stroke, it's uh, evident that when we look at results from the MPAR reg, there is quite a discordance. We know that the, the, there was a, a significant reduction in three-point maze, which is mainly driven by the uh, cardiovascular mortality. There was also a significant reduction in non-fatal MI, but uh, th there was a slight increase in the incidence of uh, stroke in the EMPA um, uh, arm as compared to the placebo arm. Now, when we compare these results to that of the leader trial with liraglutide, we can see that there's a straight line that we can see over here. And um, th there was a significant reduction in three-point maze, which is not just driven by only one factor or just CV death or non-fatal MI, but it was also driven by uh, stroke and um, CV death. So all the three endpoints, there was a significant reduction as compared to that of the SGLT2, in which we find that there was actually only one of the things which, which actually came down. And, and of course, we also know that the secondary outcomes also show that there was a significant reduction in heart failure as well with the uh, MPAREC trial. Now, uh, this is a meta-analysis which was uh, published later on in which they were looking at the um, results of all the GLP-1 receptor agonist cardiovascular outcome trials in which they found that there was in fact a significant reduction in all-cause mortality, 9% uh, reduction in hospital admissions for heart failure and a 17% reduction in renal outcomes as well with the GLP-1 receptor agonist. Um, but when they compared in the same meta-analysis, when they compared the uh, results from GLP-1 RAs versus the SGLT2 inhibitors and the number needed to treat, they found that the, the NNT was actually much lower with the GLP-1 receptor agonist as compared to the SGLT2 inhibitors, which is, uh, of course, um, a point to be noted. But one of the other differences that um, uh, I haven't uh, put included in my slide deck today was that the results with the SGLT2 versus the GLP-1 receptor agonist, when we compare, um, of course, both have completely different mechanisms of action. Um, one versus the other one is an oral group of agents, the cardiovascular, uh, uh, whereas the GLP-1 receptor agonist, except semi-oral, uh, is an injectable group. And the uh, other main is that the mechanism of action is completely different. And also the uh, effects that we find in when we compare the cardiovascular outcome trials is that with the SGLT2 inhibitors, we have more of hemodynamic benefits and reduction in heart failure. Whereas with the GLP-1 RAs, it is supposedly uh, uh, the results actually were found much later in the trial. And this may be uh, more due to anti-atherosclerotic effects. And we'll be discussing that further. So what exactly is the mechanism behind this benefit in the GLP-1 receptor agonist? When we uh, uh, sort of we tease out and try to uh, find what is the mechanism behind or the secret behind the benefits of the GLP-1 RA, we know that um, to reduce cardiovascular risk in patients in type 2 diabetes, one of the main, um, you know, the, the risk factors that we need to look at or risk reduction that we need to look at uh, would be reduction of hyperglycemia, of course, reduction of insulin resistance and body weight. All put together, it, is, it has to be a sort of a, a holistic approach to reduce CV burden in patients with type 2 diabetes. Um, and these are the risk factors which actually contribute to more of atherosclerosis and uh, cardiovascular disease. But... Um, when it comes to the mechanism of action of the GLP-1 receptor agonist, we know that there is a reduction in blood, uh, in blood glucose without the risk of hypoglycemia. There is a reduction in body weight. There is a reduction in lipids and there is a reduction in blood pressure. Is it these factors that are actually contributing to this reduction in CV risk is what we're going to be discussing in the next couple of slides. Now, when we look at results from the uh, leader trial, um, we have to, one of the points to be kept in mind is that we know that all the CVOTs, there was a reduction uh, um, in cardiovascular endpoints. And throughout the trial, all the CVOTs had to maintain the so-called glycemic equipoise. What that means is that between the drug arm and the placebo arm, they had to maintain similar HPA1C or um, shut the door. Uh, similar HPA1C between uh, both the groups. Now, 
when it came to comes to the leader trial or the any of the other trials uh, which i'll discuss further uh, if we look at both the arms the lira and the placebo arm there was in fact a 0.4 difference in hpa1c between the lira and the placebo arm so when we look at the left um, the graph over here we're looking at the hpa1c lowering there was a 0.4% difference in hpa1c between the lira there was a 0.4% more reduction in the lead, uh, in the lira arm as compared to the placebo um and um, the, the, the 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 reduction in cv risk in 3 point maze was about about 13% as we all know similarly there was also a body weight reduction so there was around 2 and 1/2 kilo uh, grams of difference between the lira arm and the placebo arm at the end of the trial and a significant 13% reduction in uh, cv risk so what we're trying to say over here and what the slide is basically asking the question is is it this reduction in hpa1c and is it this reduction in body weight that actually contributed to a 13% reduction in cardiovascular risk and the answer to that question is that it's probably 90% probably not um and then there is a gross consensus that it is probably not because we do know that a, a mere 0.4% reduction in hpa1c cannot uh, uh give us such tremendous results in reducing cv burden and just a mere 2 and 1/2 kg body weight reduction could not have alone uh, contributed to that 13% reduction in three point maze also another point to be noted is that the reduction in hpa1c uh, as i mentioned earlier although they did ne uh, need to maintain glycemic equipoise there was a varied reduction in the hpa1c between the cvots for example like i mentioned here there was a 0.4% reduction in the lira trial similarly there was about a 0.5% reduction in the albiglutide which is um, um the cvot with albiglutide uh, and yet the results between the um, trials are all varied for example here we found a 13% reduction in the leader trial whereas with the albiglutide they found a much higher i think around 20% reduction in three point maze so similarly when it comes to body weight as well with the oral sema they had a much more body weight reduction and even in, in the uh, sustain 6 as well they had a much more uh, reduction in body weight i think around 4.5 kilos as compared to 2.5 with the leader trial but the reduction in three point maze were actually varied between the results so we cannot what we are trying to say here is that just the mere hpa1c reduction or the glycemic control which is achieved using a glp1 receptor agonist or the body weight reduction or the blood pressure reduction alone uh, is not an explanation for the cv benefit that we find with the glp1 receptor agonist and there is something beyond these these uh, metabolic or these biochemical changes that we find uh, which is contributing to that cv risk reduction so um what is it if it is not just the body weight reduction if it is not just the blood pressure or the uh, hpa1c reduction that we um, achieve with the glp1 receptor agonist what is it beyond that and that is what been, went back to the pre preclinical research and then the molecular research in which they found in animal models that um, this is data in which they found that using a glp1 receptor agonist may actually even have an anti inflammatory effect and uh they found that there was a significant reduction in some of the inflammatory markers uh which may actually be contributed and as we all know that atherosclerosis itself is an inflammatory process uh and the macrophages and the whole uh, uh you know plaque formation which can contribute to atherosclerosis and um, artery disease so the uh, multiple potential benefits that we do get with a glp1 receptor agonist is one we could get as i mentioned a reduction in inflammation and then a uh, reduction in inflammation itself which may uh, in fact reduce the risk of atherosclerosis reduction in proliferation of the smooth smooth muscle cells endothelial cell protection uh, with increased nitric oxide and again a reduction in the um, um, antioxidant levels and uh, um, in the intestinal level as well and if we put it all in one one nutshell to sort of summarize the cardiovascular benefit or the cardiovascular effects of the glp1 receptor agonist we have first of all most importantly an improved glycemic control with a lower risk of hypoglycemia reduction in insulin resistance reduction in body weight reduction in triglycerides ldl and blood pressure all this of course does contribute to reduction in cardiovascular risk 
Then we also have some data to show that the GLP-1 receptor agonists may actually also reduce infarct size. There is some data in which they've actually shown that those patients admitted into the cardiac ICU, when they are put on um, uh, GLP-1 infusion, the infarct size actually reduces and, these, and those patients who were on GLP-1 infusion actually fared better with earlier discharge and better uh, ejection fraction at discharge as well. They have anti-inflammatory effects of the GLP-1. Um, there is the anti-atherosclerotic effects with reduced smooth muscle uh, proliferation and improve endothelial function due to nitric oxide vasodilatation and reduce oxidative stress. So all these factors are all the uh, explanations for the so-called uh, cardiovascular benefit with the GLP-1 receptor agonist. So Moving on, this is the reason why now that we have looked at the various benefits with the GLP-1 receptor agonists and their CV benefit has actually been proved, we now know that the guidelines over the years for valid reasons that we looked at have actually been evolving. So uh, we know that the approach of the uh, ADA and the EAST guidelines uh, probably 10 years ago or probably a decade ago was very glucose centric and we all know that the, the protocol was always based on just that HPA1C and maybe even the risk of hypoglycemia but over the years the guidelines have actually been evolving and we know that uh, today we actually have more of not just a glucose centric approach but a cardio renal metabolic approach and which is why the 2020 guidelines today are much more um, patient centric rather than glucose centric and looking at <clears throat> not just HPA1C, but also the uh, comorbid conditions or the risk reduction for complications as one of the main parameters before we choose the drug for our patient. So the ADA guidelines for, uh, for this reason has actually pushed up the GLP-1 receptor agonist as second line therapy after metformin and in patients whom on first line therapy with metformin and failure to achieve target, if they have uh, established cardiovascular disease or uh, increased cardiovascular risk, then uh, for um, the, the best drugs of choice would be an SGLT2 inhibitor if there is a risk of heart failure. But if there is an associated cardiovascular disease, then the best uh, uh, group of uh, atherosclerotic disease, then the best group of agents would be a GLP-1 receptor agonist to reduce cardiovascular risk. Similarly, the ESC, of course, went one step further where uh, they actually recommend that in patients who are drug naive, we can even, um, they've uh, pushed the, the GLP-1 receptor agonist on par with metformin uh, and can even, uh, and recommend that the GLP-1 receptor agonist or the SGLT2 inhibitors can actually be even used as monotherapy and uh, it's warranted to be used as monotherapy even without metformin or even before metformin in those patients with high cardiovascular risk. So um, we know now that these are groups of agents which have proven their CV uh, benefit beyond doubt. Uh, the cardiovascular outcome trials over the years have, um, over the past decade or so, have thrown a lot of light on the uh, benefit of these agents. Uh, and one after the other, we've had the leader, the Sustain6, the, um, uh, the, the Dulaglutide um, trial, um, and uh, the, which is a Rewind trial. All these trials which have proven the cardiovascular benefit of the GLP-1 receptor agonist. Uh, there are a lot of um, explanations, a lot of uh, hypothetical explanations through, uh, to um, explain the mechanism through which they reduce cardiovascular risk, not just the body weight reduction or the blood pressure or the blood glucose reduction, but also other mechanisms like the anti-inflammatory uh, risk reduction as well. And uh, for uh, these reasons, the guidelines have actually pushed the GLP-1 receptor agonist up the scale uh, uh, in the management of type 2 diabetes. Thank you.